so we were probably two months out from moving. We were going to be moving to Porterville, California, and we were going to be um, opening our own home for developmentally disabled. And I can remember I was <laughs> still had a lot of issues. I still had drinking issues. I still had, <laughs> if I had chance to do drugs, minor drugs, like smoke a joint, at a bar with somebody or whatever, I was still having them kinds of problems. So one night I went to, uh, once again, my brother's bar, but he was uh, bartending at a different bar, a Chinese uh, restaurant bar. And I went there and sure enough, I got a little bit too drunk. And at the time we owned a little light blue Volkswagen. And I think it was in 1972. And so I was driving home and it was late. It had to be at least 12 or one in the morning um, because I was still having big time trouble with stress issues. And the kind of work we were doing was definitely stressful. And so I would kind of run away and go do my little drinking thing by myself. And of course I didn't have control of it, over it and I was still making stupid decisions like driving after drinking. So I headed home and I went through this town called Tulare and there was a red light. And of course, in my, my memory, it was the other guy's fault, but I think in reality, it was my fault. I was drinking quite a bit. And so I went and probably ran this light and I got broadsided by these guys and I mean, it totaled that Volkswagen, but it hit on the passenger side. So I was okay physically. So instead of being in fear or whatever, I got out of the car because I was mad, because I was drunk. And I thought, them, them suckers ran right into me. So, you know, in my mind, that was their fault. They just totaled my car. So I got out cussing and they were cussing and turned out they were, they were biker guys. And, uh, you know, they were pretty rowdy looking. And so they came up to me and said, dude, you, you ran a red light? And, no, I didn't, blah, blah, blah. So we sat there arguing back and forth. Neither one of us wanted to call the cops because, you know, insurance reasons. And they were probably drinking, too. So I can remember reaching in one of the pockets and taking a cigarette out and, <laughs> and lighting it. And uh, they looked at each other and thought, hey, this kind of got me some respect there. This guy's got some cojones reaching in my leather jacket and taking a cigarette from me without even asking. And so they thought that was pretty cool, I, I guess, because I said, hey, dude, you got to get me right home. You just stole my car. Can you do that? Where you live? Uh, probably five miles from there. So they said, jump in the back of the truck. So I got in the back of the truck and they were they were talking trash and blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't paying much attention because I was, I was really probably pretty ripped. And so we lived on a dirt road and they, I told them how to get there. And so they got us there and all the way home, I'm thinking they crashed my car. And I mean, they totaled that thing. That was their fault. By the time I'm home, I'm ticked. So I went busting in the house. It's midnight, one in the morning. And I think you were awake. She was waiting for me, probably praying for I me. I was on my knees. Yeah, she's <laughs> praying that I got home alive. So I remember where I stashed my dad's 22 pistol. And I said, I'm going to shoot them people. So my wife said, what are you doing? What are you doing with that gun? Don't worry about it. Get out of the way. So I went outside. Pow, pow, pow. I just started shooting. She told me she remembers better than I do because I was ripped. She said I was shooting into the ground, so I wasn't really trying to kill anybody. But And I probably wasn't in my mind. I was probably just trying to scare them. So I'm shooting <laughs> shooting in the ground out. They dive in the back of this truck. And they're going down serpentine all over down the dirt road. And I hear them screaming, get the hell out of here, you know, floor it, go, go, go. So they take off. And I remember my neighbor, who was our boss, his, his name was uh, Jay, Jay mm -hmm. and he was a truck driver. And he comes over the next day and says, what the heck happened last night? 
And they had no idea I still had drinking issues and, you know, all that stuff. And so uh, I said, well, I, I told them the story and I said, you know, then, then people might come back looking for me because I shot at them. And he goes, don't worry, I got a 12 gauge. I got your back. They come back. We'll take care of them. <laughs> and so it was a next night was foggy. You couldn't see 10 feet in front of you and it gets real foggy where we live in this valley. And so sure enough, we hear like 100, 200 motorcycles, man, and I'm going, oh, yes, you know, they're looking for us because we could hear them go, going up and down the road. And the, the good news was is they had forgot where they were. There's no doubt in my mind because they were drunk too. They were drinking too. And uh, it, it was so out where there's nothing that they probably no way remembered that road or where we lived or anything. So we could hear for about a half hour going up and down. No, Jay, he's out there with his shotgun. He's ready for him, right? Like we could have done anything. Uh, so anyway, nothing came of that. Uh, it was it was the early years of the um, the dysfunction and the drama is what I, I mean. You know, it took quite a journey. It, things were changing bit by bit, and here. We had gone from literally being under a tree to where we got approved to open our own home, and we were in process mm -hmm. for that. And I got pregnant, and here we're expecting our first son, and probably about six months away, and this and that. But the the <clears throat> dysfunction of the ongoing stuff that we were trying to hide. Um, and I wasn't drinking every day then, or doing no. drugs. This was, uh, I was doing a lot better, matter of fact. We got a new job, or we were doing good financially. And, you know, and so, but when I did go and, and let loose, that anger was still there, dysfunction from Nam and all that. So all that I'd try to, to hide from. And that's the way I relaxed. I went and got plastered. So still didn't quite have it under control. You know, I, I was no. thinking about... Um, the funniest thing here we were we had like a few weeks till we were supposed to move and here we were going to go from literally making the two of us six hundred dollars a month was what we were making to meet all of our needs and uh, all of a sudden here we were going to be making literally like three thousand dollars a month helping these folks that we'd fallen in love with and so the first thing that we did when we realized that we actually had some money because I'm sure nobody will remember this our age, but but the big deal back in the day, here we were gonna get our, our own home, we had a steady income, and the first thing we did was we went to the biggest waterbed store in all of Tulare County, I think it was in Porterville, and we picked out together, that was the thing in the days, that's what everybody wanted to have. The, the, the whole headboard had like, lights and bookshelves and the frame and pay attention to this because by the end of what we share today you're going to understand why it's important the old original water beds not only when they were filled up with water but the frames had to be like 500 pounds so i'll never forget our first purchase for our new little home we were setting up after a regional center said yeah we'll license you sat in front of a group of people said their folks are doing really good and so we started getting things for the house. And, uh, you know, one of the other things that through this whole time, on top of taking care of the folks, uh, before they actually got placed with us, I was always looking, I didn't realize this till later, but as the wife of somebody who was dealing with uh, post-traumatic stress and dysfunction and black glasses and wouldn't fill out a job app hardly, these kinds of things, um, I decided that until that we got our first check for the folks, that we were going to go ahead and take a job for the Polk Company. <laughs> That's what you want to do when you're dysfunctional. You hate people. You hate authority. You don't want to talk to anybody. And your wife goes out and gets you a job where you go door to door knocking and talk to total strangers saying, who don't want to give you information and saying, hi, I'm with the Polk Company. And we want to know everything that's none of our business. How many people live here? How much do you make? 
And and supposedly <laughs> this Polk company made these big registers that then people decided how much money would go to the county's different programs or whatever. But so I'll never forget here. I am like so pregnant. It hurts to even walk. I was like so pregnant. And I get this job and I remember you just like, you wouldn't take your glasses off. You were so mad at me. You were so mad at me. And I said, we need to do something. Our initial little money that- I think I got bit by a dog. That was me. Somebody got bit by a dog. I thought it was me. <laughs> I'll never forget. Anyway, it was when it, it yes, stuck. Went up, it, we went were up, supplementing. We were supplementing. Yes. So we're going and, and going all over the city. And I'll never forget that, that I walked up on a porch and this little black dog came around the side, watched me talk to its owner, and then waited till the owner closed the door. And we turned and you went off the porch first. And this little stinking cross of a chihuahua, ankle whatever, ankle biter. Yeah. He put his teeth into my calf. Yeah. Like serious. It was awesome. I <laughs> I knocked him off and that's what you get. Tried not to hurt him. Signing up with a poke, poke, whatever it is. Poke company. Poke. Yeah. So then time was going on and we uh, actually got two of our clients from the house that we had been working in, into Larry. And then they, um, they talked about possibly wanting to place some more with us if we ever got like a bigger place or whatever. But during that time, you were getting ready to have your first baby. And me, yeah, you claim no, you were you getting, claim to this day that you actually oh, yeah, had yeah. Isaac. Yeah, do you remember? Yeah, most men get that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so we uh, we actually had set it up where we had to drive over forty minutes away, and um, to get to the hospital, we were in a different city, and my doctor is in the hospitals and stuff. And so here, in the midst of all this crazy making, we had no clue what we were going to get. This is not the days and age where people went to classes and learned about this and learned about that. Um, we were so busy just trying to deal with the couple folks that we had. We were busy. We yeah. were busy. And they and they promised me, I remember talking to my doctor and he said, oh, don't worry about it. All the nurses are really good and they'll help you go through whatever. So me being Miss Optimistic, Happy Face, I'm like, I literally will never forget. I did absolutely no preparation. I had no clue the responsibility. I had no clue what I was going to go through physically. And so one day we decided to head over to watch one of your nephews play basketball. And uh, out of nowhere, it was like three weeks before my even my due date. And I'll never forget, um, we couldn't, we couldn't find, this is, this is the truth. We could not find his game. We hadn't bothered to ask which high school his game was at. This was your nephew, Randy. And so we were running all over town it, from high school to high school to high school, trying to find out where he was playing. And you kept hitting railroad tracks. And we thought that was really funny. And we were joking about it. And you, and you made a joke about getting this baby out or something. I was like, yeah, oh my gosh. But seriously, we ran over railroad tracks <laughs> repeatedly. We finally found where he was playing. We walked in and within two minutes of standing there, I realized I had a situation that lets you know that you're ready to have a baby. And so I said, oh my God, we need to, we need to go. We need to go have this baby right now. We ended up we ended up in the hospital on a weekend with a doctor we didn't know. We still, we had the Volkswagen back by then, and you were singing, let's get physical, thought you're all cool. I was None of this idiot. was going to be drama. It's going to be a piece of cake. Let's get physical from the <laughs> 60s. She goes, come on, you you drive. Let's go have this baby type thing. Clueless. I was. Do you want to tell a story about that doctor or me? Go ahead. So we get to the hospital, and, and it's the weekend. <laughs> And so we don't have a clue what we're doing about anything. Uh, she's having the, you know, the pain type of thing. Old school, you know, get this thing out, let's go. So they go, well, you, first of all, your doctor's not here. He's gone for the weekend. So we said, oh, so they, they we got to, you know, put you in a room and all this stuff. And she's, she's already screaming berserk. Give me pain pills. Give me a shot. Do something. I'm dying type of thing. We don't have a doctor yet. The nurse is gone. 
he'll be okay. And the nurses go, boy, this is a drama queen here. And so we're sitting there waiting for a doctor and I see this old scraggly ball-headed man, his hair hanging out like this, no shoes on, in his socks. He had a red flannel shirt like he'd been hunting. He, he's staggering up the hallway towards us and I said, <laughs> If that's who they're giving you, we're out of here. We're we going to go, go. Home. We'll have it at home. <laughs> so the guy walks up, doesn't introduce himself to me. You know, hello, I'm going to be your doctor this weekend. He's a replacement for our regular doctor. And he looks at her and he goes over and looks at her. and <laughs> looks bad. This looks bad. And he says, if this baby is in here by so-and-so, we're going to have to take it cesarean. Right? And turns around and walks away. By Never way, did introduce herself by the way, to either one of us. Yeah, I and mean, said, by the way, you're not in labor, so we have to induce your labor, which was three in the afternoon. And they put me in hard, hard labor because my body wasn't doing what it was supposed to. So by like six or seven, he walks in and says, if you don't have this baby real soon, um, we're going to have to take you into a C-section. But evidently they had another emergency. But Oh, my She is gosh. screaming, Zaya. Find me a nurse. Now I got to have a cigarette. I smoke it. I I'm going outside you. to smoke. <laughs> She's Where? freaking. My strength. So, so the guy, nurse comes in and, dude, you, you better do, she thinks she's going to die. You better give her something. Oxygen. And so what why they can't you give her a shot? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I said, uh, you, yeah. A hyperventilated. They you, gave me a paper bag. You can give her a shot <laughs> and you better do that right away. So they give her a shot. And it must have been half hour later, she's wanting another one. <laughs> and so the lady goes, we can't do that. I said, somebody better do something. I mean, it's, this woman, you know the drama in, in this woman? It went, well, it went, the joke was this here I went in singing, mm -hmm. let's get physical. And next thing I'm screaming, give me drugs. <laughs> Take this child. I don't want this child. Take this baby. <laughs> what did you do to me? <laughs> And I'm crazy. thinking, what's wrong with it? Don't you people know what you're doing here? <laughs> this woman's dying. Give her drugs. So at about six. Can't do it. Can't give it. So six, God sent six, an angel, morning. but he sent her an angel oh. in the middle of the night that took over for the other nurse. B. And she was cool. She went and got her something when she wasn't supposed to and gave her another really good shot. Well, I don't know how it all works, but they relieved her pain. And so we're talking all night. I mean, all night this went on. She's screaming and, you know, go get me more drugs and just all night long. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, my God. You were the deer in the headlights, just like you I can't can't smoke. Her. Don't leave. I go, yeah, but I got to smoke. <laughs> I have this horrible habit. You're like, do you, do you mind? Do you mind if I go have a cigarette, honey? It's like, do I and mind? Her, her claws are in me. Anything I did, it was wrong. Yeah. You know, stay right here. Hold my hand. Find the nurse. I need drugs. Blah, blah, blah. So finally at six in the morning, they came in and said, um, we can see. We were, we were close. Ready. We, we were could close. See, you could see his little hair. He had a lot of hair. Yes, he did. And so they were going to take her down to the to them were the days they didn't do it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that that that. Well, the humor of anybody that's in a modern society is you got to jump from the bed where you were in excruciating pain. You got to jump onto a cold, hard steel gurney with no pads on it because they didn't want any germs, and they ran you down the hall to the delivery room. Yeah. And so then uh, Isaac arrived. And I was just thinking, because you've been encouraging people saying, don't give up your children or your treasures. I, the joy of having our first baby in spite of all what we were walking through was incredible. I was a superstar. <laughs> I was still into me, but I had a son. <laughs> and I went crazy. I bought all them cigars like you do and all this stuff. And I remember we, we finally, he had a breathing problem and uh, yeah. scared me to death. He was six pounds, seven ounces. He was so tiny. Three weeks early. And, well, his dad's not exactly. I'm all of five, seven. So he, and she's what, five, five. So he came out like very tiny and lightweight. He was healthy, but he was having breathing issues. And so and after being up all night long, 
And hearing that, of course, I freaked out and I said, where is he type of thing? Because mom didn't have him because they had to have him on a breathing thing. Mm -hmm. So they told me where he was and I had to look at him through a glass. I couldn't even go close to him. And I can remember that was the most devastating thing. I was so scared. And so when they finally told me he was okay and we got to go home, I was telling everybody. I just had a son. I mean, I didn't care what they thought. So I can remember cooking her a steak and she was breastfeeding that little guy. And, and I, firewood. I, I ran to the store, to a hardware store. Mm -hmm. And I was going to buy some firewood because we had a fireplace. And cook them a steak, and uh, man, I was on cloud nine. So I can remember shopping in that place. My brain's all, you know, all about Isaac. Can't wait to get back and see him from the store. And I remember that clerk saying, dude, that is so awesome. You just had your first son. He said, you know what? All this stuff's on, on us. You don't have to pay for it. So I can remember I got free firewood, free whatever I bought stuff. And so we got to tell the story. So we go back home. We have this great steak and fire and God, we're both in heaven. And then night came when you're supposed to sleep. <laughs> and this baby's going off. And I looked at her and said, uh, did you feed him? Yeah. I said, call your mother. I can't deal with this all night long. This is insane. She calls her mom. <laughs> And uh, my mother-in-law says, uh, Diana, did you, she names off all these things. Did you do this? Did you burp him? Did you do this? Did you feed him? Did you do this and that? And she said, yeah, I did all them things. Well, did you change him? <laughs> I looked at her. She said, no. So it had these little We were so scared. Pampers. Double zeros. Yeah. Double zeros. Tiny little. So she changed him. He's out like that. So the next time he woke up, I remember I walked him. I'll do that. <laughs> Come here, little <laughs> prince. You stepped yeah. in when I didn't have anything yeah, else. She to was give. dead. She was dead. So we went from Isaac, and we had several folks with us, and then we got the great news that that the young man that we referred to as Baby Bird, that if we found a bigger house, he could join us. And so here. Time flew and we started looking for a bigger house and we ended up finding a um, whole nother hysterical story about the realtor. Uh, but we ended up finding a home in Terrabella, California that was absolutely amazing. Uh, we didn't have the money to do it. It was miracle after miracle that made it happen. But the joke was about that waterbed. When moving day came, we not only had our two folks and Isaac, we were doing what was referred to in the industry as a respite for two other clients that needed to just stay with us for two weeks so their parents could have a break. And so on the moving day, memory, we only memory. had one relative that showed up for a few hours. Thank you, Pat. And uh, <laughs> other than that, we, we literally, he and I, and at the time I was like 130 pounds, was we were moving the whole house, had all the folks, Oh my God, we had, we didn't know the one little client had an ear infection and this poor little girl who was deaf and blind was sitting in the front of a car trying to kick the windows out. But you we thought, it, against it. well, we I thought it was just them. dysfunction because we took care of folks <clears throat> that were profoundly infirmed and they didn't communicate too well. And this was way back in the early days of that industry. But anyway, so here we were down to the last thing. And we still were making up for not having a full household of folks. And I'll never forget the last thing that we had to move out of that house was the stinking 10,000 pound, not to exaggerate. That sucker waterbed was so crazy. And I will never forget, we had already emptied out 90% of the water and you and I drug, we drug that bag with a little water that was left out while I've got Isaac in a little chair on the front lawn. We've got the folks in car seats. Everything's going. And finally, we get to literally the frame of the giant water bed. And you looked at me, and I was begging. I said, my God, get a neighbor, get anybody. And we lived on a street. There was nobody under 70, 75. It wasn't happening. And finally, Dennis just looked at me, and he goes, you're always talking to God, he'll help you, <laughs> something like that. It was like, you're always asking for help. You're one I've got, so you can do it. 
And I mean, we just, I scream my head off and we edged that giant, that giant frame to the back and thank God the truck had a lift on the back. And we finally, we got it up in the truck and we drove, it was like about an eight mile trip from where we were the, living. The trials of young people, young couples. <laughs> it's crazy. I said, listen, here's the deal. This U-Haul is due back <laughs> in X amount of time. Mm -hmm. And the new place we found out in the country was what, 20 miles away from where we lived. Mm -hmm. And I said, every one of these guys around here is 75 years old. They're not gonna help us. I said, it's me and it's you. Yeah. And time's clicking right now. And there's no way I am paying an extra whatever it was I don't back. think we had it. Amount of money for, for <laughs> this freaking truck. So here's what we're gonna do. Whitney, because I went to Redwood. It's a school choke, High school uh, thing. High school thing. I said, you get your wimpy tail up on your feet. Quit crying for one thing. I can't do it. I cannot do it. I said, you'd be surprised what you can do when you have to. Stand up. <laughs> now I'm going to count to three. All you got to do is put that freaking thing on that lift and we're, we're out. We got it. So one and two. He's like, tell man so he's going to get his tooth knocked. <laughs> three. <laughs> She lets out. Ah! So but we did it. And she did it. It got on there. Man, we were happy. So camping. we drove like crazy. And then when I went back to take the truck back, we got we got Chinese food. We and we fell were in so, the Chinese food. Oh my God. We fell in the Chinese we food. So we tired. set nothing up in the house. Us, the four clients. A house full of furniture, you and know, we baby. literally passed out, and I mean, everybody baby. slept in the child living room that night till the next morning. It was it was quite the movie day. It was amazing. It was awesome. It was awesome. Best Chinese food we <laughs> ever ate. It was probably garbage, but we, we didn't care. No, it wasn't garbage. <laughs> we lived in that town a while. We knew good Chinese uh, food. We did. What was garbage was the weather. And what, the, oh, what right. the kids had to go through, not was, what we went through. It was in through. the hundreds. Yeah. And little tiny kids and the disabled folks were in that heat. And that's what worried us to death. We've got to get them out of this heat. And so we it probably took us 15 minutes before you quit sniveling. And and, and the, the truck did have air, the U-Haul. So they were in front with air conditioning going. But it still was hot, right? It was crazy. But, but so anyway, that, we, that we was, did it. And so then finally we were in a position where we had gone literally homeless veteran underneath a tree, crazy beginnings <laughs> to where we were going to be buying our first home in the country on an acre with a swimming pool. Beautiful home. We'll have to tell you about on the next episode. So. Yeah. Great memories. Yeah. That was only one son. I got two more. So anyway, we'll never forget. Is that our first move? Second. Yeah, one, number two. How many? Yeah. Those were the days. Hey, YouTube family. This episode, I wanted to share about another group called Team Red, White, and Blue. When Dennis and I were at Monty Roberts Horse Sense and Healing, we met an amazing man, Paul Coscos, and ended up... Um, hearing about him and his wife, Roxana, and their involvement in Team Red, White, and Blue. Here's a little uh, paragraph from somebody that became involved with them. Their mission is to bring people, connect returning soldiers socially with uh, physical and social involvement. Here's a little note that they have on their website from a person that said, Team Red, White, and Blue has literally saved my life. I struggled with depression at times and went to a very dark place where I didn't think I was going to climb out of it. Team Red, White, and Blue reached out to me. They grabbed my hands and helped pull me out of a pit. Without this family, I don't know where I would be today. And as you know, we're proponents of having your children, your spouse, your best friends, your family will help pull you out of those dark places. So if you haven't had a chance to check them out, I believe they're in over 190 locations. They've helped over a quarter of a million people. 
Their stats are that a lot of people don't realize almost 250,000 people a year are leaving, getting, um, uh, exiting the armed services. So uh, here's another help, Team Red, White, and Blue. Check them out.